happy 2024, Dr. Rob. Thanks, Tammy. Can you believe it? it? Is, uh, <laughs> well, I was thinking back on some, when something happened and I was like, oh, that's two years ago, but it was eight years ago. And I realized, oh my, oh my gosh, yeah. I miss out on the, the faster it goes, the shorter it goes. I don't know. But I don't know. I yes. look back and I think, wow, another year. Wow. It's, how could that I be? know. Well, and you start a year and you go, oh, it's, you know, a long year and lots to do. And then all of a sudden it's the next year. So it's kind of crazy. Well, but I'm still in are. 1996. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. I don't. Okay. So Dr. Rob, I have a question that came from someone who could not be here tonight, but I'm going to read this to you. Female partner, right. eight years to a man, I believe is an essay, though not diagnosed. He has cheated over 30 times in eight years. I cannot find it within me to phys to be physically intimate with him until something is done about this behavior. He, however, continues to cheat and claims he is doing this because his physical needs are not being met by me. I'm also in stages of ongoing, continually re-injuring uh, betrayal trauma. Um, he, yeah, he, he asked, or this person asked if we could address this and this, th I'm doing that. I don't normally do bring outside ones in, but this is the type of stuff that comes up often with the, you need to do this for me. I'm cheating because of you. So can you talk about that? You know, some please. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, I do private consultations with people and I say this every single time I do it. And I actually ask the spouses to write it down. And so what I would say to this person directly is there is nothing that you have ever done that can cause this person to do this. There's nothing you're doing now and there's nothing you could ever do to cause this to happen. That that when I choose to cheat or act out sexually, that's my choice and it has nothing to do with you. Um, I will blame you and I will make you responsible. And I might even inside of myself say, well, I'm not getting this and I'm not getting that. So I deserve entitlement to be able to go, go do that. But what, what, what nobody deserves is the ability to cause you harm or hurt, you know, and no one deserves, and uh, sorry, no one has the right to cause you harm or hurt. No one has the right to say to you, it's your fault that I'm doing this thing that hurts you. So, I don't care how much sex a person's having or not. I don't care how often they're being fr frequently being sex. Couples often have different levels of desire, different um, frequency, and it's not unusual. And some couples don't have sex at all. Some couples have sex every day. There is no right or wrong here. What's wrong is blaming you because I have desires or interests or that, and that you're not meeting and therefore I get to. You know what? I could learn how to be sexual um, with you in different ways. I could learn how to tolerate my feelings. I could work on it in therapy. There are a million things that I can do to work through this issue other than saying, I get to do whatever I want to do and it's your fault. So if you want me to address his stance, um, I think it's um, manipulative at best. And I think his stance is a place in a place of let, if, if you shut up and stop complaining about what I'm doing, because it's your fault anyway, and I'm going to do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. So cheating 30 times in eight years, I can tell you he is an SA. And now he may have other emotional issues, or he may have mental health issues that are driving this. I don't know. I can't say I don't know him. Um, and I haven't assessed or interviewed him. But I will say if he's reasonably functional in life, uh, he can make it to work, he can, you know, earn a living, he can be around friends and family and function, then this is probably a choice. And this is probably being blamed on you. So I also want to say that I wouldn't want to be physically intimate with someone who is lying to me, who was cheating on me, and who was doing whatever they might be doing that I don't even know about. And not only do I think that you are someone who, I don't want to say entitled, but has a reason to feel this kind of betrayal trauma, but my thought would be, have you been STD tested? You know, this person's lying to you. They're cheating on you. They're blaming you. Who? Are, what kind of sex are they having with other people? And then going back and having sex with you. Um, so I'm going to say some stuff that I often say. One of them was, you know, you're never at fault. And the other one is, I wouldn't want to have sex with people I don't trust. That's the bottom line. And so if I'm trying to have sex with someone to keep a relationship together, or I'm trying to do it to make them happy, and they're giving me reasons to feel betrayed and hurt and not trusting, and they're continuing to do that, there, I don't. I would question what reason there would be to be sexual with this person. And if I, no matter how much my mind tried to convince me that it was okay, your body 
is telling you, I don't feel comfortable doing this. I don't want to do this. And I think it's really important that you listen to that. So to the man in this situation, I say, I think that you either look at this as a problem and take responsibility for it yourself. And by the way, the problem is the lying, the blaming, the entitlement, the hiding, the manipulation, um, the ghost, the gaslighting. Those are the problems. The sexual choices, you, you know, she could say to you, do whatever you want. It's fine with me. And I'll just say this last thing. I, I said it today. I, I've always been fine with people having whatever kind of sex they want. When they would come in my office and they'd say, I want to see sex workers and I want to do this and I want to do that. My answer was, go ahead, as long as you first clear it with your wife or your partner. Because if it's OK with them, it's OK with me. But this is not OK with you. And I don't see this any differently than stealing your money or stealing something. That's, this person is stealing your soul. So in no way could I validate or support this behavior, if nothing else, because if I love you and I am hurting you and you tell me that's hurting you, then it's my job to stop. Or maybe I need to leave you if my needs need to get met somewhere else. But I certainly don't get to blame you as a way to feel entitled to do what I want to do. So I've said that in as many ways as I can, Tammy. Well, I have a question for you still, though, because he's talking about it's one of my needs. And, you know, and you talked about people having different sexual patterns or whatever. But, you know, the, like we talk often about people taking a period of abstinence as they, you know, enter into recovery. Like for someone to identify this as a need, again, I agree with you. It sounds like a sex addict, you know, if you pri place Great. a priority on that. So, but like, you, you know, uh, how do you uh, how do you address that piece of it, please? Well, you know, I, I think that people can be sexual without necessarily having sex with each other. In other words, and I'm going to be a little graphic. If you want to be sexual and I don't, I could hold you. I could caress you. I could nurture you. I could stroke your hair. I can be with you while you have a sexual experience without necessarily getting involved. So if you wanted to have more frequent sexuality, that doesn't mean that it has to be immediately in that moment with you. Um, you can be present. You can be engaged. You can be supportive. You can be touching. There are many ways that couples can work this out other than my solution is to cheat. Um, and also people can learn how to tolerate their desires and find other ways to feel intimate and communicate other than just saying, I mean, this is a really, this is akin to uh, an offending kind of section. This is akin, akin to offending because it basically says, um, if you don't consent every time I want you to consent, then I'm going to find ways to do whatever I want and blame you and find someone who will consent. And that's really abusive. That goes beyond um, just cheating, that is really disrespecting who you are as a person. So, Tammy, I don't know if you answered your question, and I'm well, actually no, going to run it, off one second, but I'll be right yeah. back, but go ahead. No, and the, and that helps, but I also, um, a, a sex addict will perceive that sex is the most important need, and and um, it, you know, I often share with people that addiction, whatever form it takes, is a maladaptive coping mechanism. So like Dr. Rob said, you know, there are other ways beyond even, you know, sex with self, because lots of guys, you know, have porn and masturbation issues, and women too, I don't want to make it gender specific. But, but in this case, you know, answering this question, so, so just uh, going, okay, now I have permission to, you know, masturbate, you know, nonstop isn't, you know, necessarily the right thing. I think Dr. Rob talking about learning to tolerate emotions and being uncomfortable. And, you know, what is it if I, if I'm uncomfortable, if I'm stressed, if I'm bored or whatever, what do I need to do in order, you know, how do I engage in life in a, in a different way? That's the, you know, that's the part of the recovery journey is learning to, to do that because we are good at escaping and going, you often share Dr. Rob, you know, it's intensity rather than intimacy. And so I know that it was called physical intimacy, you know, but sex addicts prove over and over again that, you know, you can have sex without any kind of intimacy. It's, you know, so, so, you know, unfortunately for betrayed partners, you know, if you are just there to serve him or service him or whatever, you know, like that, I would, I, you know, I, you know, that would be tough to, you know, to feel like that's really intimate, you know, intimacy is vulnerability. It's, you know, telling you, I'm really scared. I'm really uncomfortable. And I want to have sex because that would make me feel better, but let's just sit and talk or hold hands or whatever. That would be different. And that would be intimacy. So hopefully and I, I want to say just ahead, one please. more thing. 
Mm -hmm. which is if I love you and the important mm -hmm. thing is our relationship, then how can I blame you and over and over again demand something and, and then feel entitled to do something that's good? How can I hurt you and say that I love you? How can I know mm -hmm. that what's going to hurt you and do it anyway? Um, I wonder if this person is... Um, that their needs are so important to them that they will look beyond what's really important, which is the connection between how can I hurt you? How can I say what you want, what I need is more important than what you feel? Um, that's just not healthy. And my concern for you really, in terms of my addressing this, it goes back to you, which is how long are you going to let yourself be hurt, let down and kind of abused by this person um, before you have to stand up and say, I I'm not willing to accept this anymore. Um, doesn't mean you have to leave, doesn't mean you have to break it off, but I'm not going to accept your cheating just because you don't think I'm not what you need. If I'm not what you need, go somewhere else. Um, you know, there are a lot of ways to handle this, but I'm concerned that you are even asking the question about taking any responsibility at your end, because there is nothing that you have done wrong by respecting yourself. Um, and don't okay, let him convince you that. Yeah. So we're, I put the first question in and answered. My SA and I married nine years, became parents one and a half years ago. He was sober for six years, but then immediately stopped group therapy and distanced himself. I separated into another bedroom with our special needs child. Four months ago, he decides he wants to be a family. However, I found his underwear pantyhose stash in our house. He stated he wears them to masturbate and took a pair from a woman in the laundromat. I just learned he's been doing this since he was 12. He's almost 50. I sat with his CSAT and, and him to ask the plan. It's group. It's one group a week. Is this adequate? He has a career at stake. I'm in therapy. I'm pissed off. Well, I think there are so many different questions here that I need to break them down. Um, and I'll just break them down quickly. And Tammy, if you want to jump in, I would love that. Number one, um, it is not unusual for the men that I work with to begin to act out when their partner has a baby. Um, and the reason for that is, is that in a narcissistic way, we want all the attention. We want all the validation. We, you know, we're used to getting it. We're the only one in the relationship. When a child or another person, when a child comes along, all of a sudden, I'm not the most important person in the world. In fact, my job is to focus on you and that child. And I think there are many men, and this is not unusual, even with healthy men, to feel jealous, to feel envious, to want to back away. But healthy men say, well, I'm going to put those needs aside because I know in a couple of years, you know, boy, am I going to be the most important person to that little kid. So this is a separate issue. One issue is why did, did this person maybe return to acting out or start distancing themselves? That's one issue. But the issue about pantyhose, wearing them to masturbate, um, doing this since I was 12, that's a fetish. And what that means is that I am interested in having some object as a part of my sexuality, like leather, like a whip, like feet. Um, and that is a primary desire that I have. And I either enjoy sex only when those things are there, or I enjoy sex more when they are there. There are different issues here because if someone comes to me and they say, even like a spouse or the person, you know, I'm looking at this, um, these images, or I like wearing this, or um, I like being, you know, held down or something. Um, that's something that is, is not sex addiction. So I can desire things and hide things that I'm ashamed of. I certainly might not feel good as a man the fact that I actually am interested in masturbating or engaging with, um, with women's clothes. But we don't look at that in my field as a, as a, um, a pathology. It is something to be accepted and integrated and worked on. The, the issues I have here is the years and years of secrecy. The hiding, again, it's not as much about the sex as how you're being treated. I would think to myself, how can we been, be together so long and you have hidden this incredibly important part of you? But this person's interest in doing that is not sex addiction. That's a fetish. They enjoy sex with this object. We don't blame or shame someone about having um, objects, unless they're abusive or harmful, in their lives that turn them on. 
Um, and just because they want to get rid of it or you want to get rid of it, some people will come into therapy and say, oh, I'm into panties or I'm into lace or I'm into feet or whatever. And I want to get rid of that because that's sex addiction. Well, that isn't sex addiction, even though they may want to get rid of it and they don't like it about themselves. Um, we don't stop healthy behaviors or healthy, different kinds of sexual behaviors because the person doesn't like it. Um, in fact, I think it would be a a, 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 um, a bad, I hate to use the word, but it would be an under-informed and problematic therapist who would take someone on for sex addiction if what was really troubling them was some kind of fetish. Um, and I've had men, by the way, who were greatly interested in men but they were married to a woman and they say, well, if I just stop being interested in men, if I just stop looking at male porn, if I just stop my desire to hook up with men, um, then things would be better and I'd feel better. And so that must be an addiction. The fact that I'm interested in men must be an addiction because I'm married and I love you. And well, we also would not look at that as an addiction. We would look at it as a part of their sexuality. The problem is hiding it, keeping it a secret, not including you, pushing you out of the bedroom. Um, all of those things are the problems. And by the way, if you have a special needs child, you need more support. You need more nurturing. You need more involvement by that man. And so he's not only stepping away from you emotionally and sexually at the time when you most need the support, he's moving away from you on every level. And that's just I think that's tragic because you need so much more help and support just having a child, no less a special needs child. Um, so Tammy, I, as I asked, I hope that you can jump in on some of this. There's so much. Yeah, and, in no, these questions. yeah and, and I agree, I guess the, you know, that he was sober for six years. I'm skeptical, you know, cause I think he's got a really good pattern of hiding this stuff. So, and mm -hmm. I, I like you, Dr. Rob was curious, what is he sober from? Because it sounds like all of this fetish stuff is new information to you. So, so mm -hmm. th th there's, there's a lot more to be revealed. Um, but I, I'm going to go to the let let's say, you know, he's a sex addict and um, there's legitimate sex addiction things um, like, I, you know, he, you guys are in a lot of crisis. I, I would I would be skeptical that, you know, going to one group a week and working with his, you know, CSAT is enough. You know, if he actually had some period of, of sobriety, you know, I, I don't know what his pattern was and how often he was going, but, you know, like, you know, when people come back to, to meetings, it's like 12 step is 90 meetings in 90 days. That would, you know, it's really about actions, you know, shifting things in a different way. So separating, you know, what Dr. Rob said about fetishes. So if there's, you know, sex addiction, which I suspect there is, and then there's the, these other fetish behaviors that you've discovered, you know, then, you know, him getting, and, and why would he not, why would he not want to get the help that he needs and do as much as he can in actionable ways to show you that he's working on being a trustworthy husband, a trustworthy father. So, but I, I agree with Dr. Rob too, all the light, lying and secrets and hiding things, you know, I, I don't blame you for being pissed off. That said, there, you know, we have resources for you. I'm so glad you're here. Um, and I don't know what your bandwidth is. We've got drop-in groups for you, but we also have um, the Betrayed Partner online work group. I'll put the link in the chat starting on Wednesday. So uh, Angela Spearman does a great job um, with facilitating that. All of our work groups are live facilitated. You know, it's about healthy boundaries. It's a whole bunch of content that would be really useful for you. So if you're able to participate that could be really good for you i will i will put the link in so i'm okay, also ready working, for the, um, go ahead go ahead one more thing which is i just went on wikipedia and i looked up underwear fetishism mm -hmm. um f-e-t-i-s-h-i-s-m underwear fetishism and there's a whole long discussion about why people put on underwear what does it mean to them what does it mean to men putting on women's panties women uh, putting all that stuff and i think you know really what i would strongly recommend is that you learn more you know gain information what is the difference between as tammy said what is this person's sobriety because if it's an attempt to avoid this thing that turns them on that's not what sobriety is about um this is someone who's taken something that arouses them that they may not feel good about and hidden it and um don't feel they can engage in it with you present so there's a lot to learn here there's lots of questions um but a lot of things are unanswered and so i think you have a lot more self-education um and yeah i think going to therapy together and trying to figure this out together would be really really helpful um 
I have one more quick thing because about the laundromat sure. and stealing. Like the last thing he wants well, to be brought up on is the news because he's, you know, right. stealing things from the laundromat. So, so I mean, that's a little side thing, but you know, oh goodness, you know, like that's the kind of stuff that hits the local news. And you said a job is at stake, et cetera. So, so you know, learning to live in integrity, you know, whatever that looks like, you know, would be, I think, important for all of you. So, and and by the way, what I would see that as being a shame. I don't want to walk into Walmart and buy women's panties, but it's so much easier for me to just grab them when I think no one's looking. And, but it actually, it increases the shame, right? Cause now I'm stealing. Um, mm -hmm. And you're, so there's so much here. I really, mm -hmm. and by the way, if people want referrals, it is T A M I <laughs> Tammy at seeking integrity.com. We don't get kickbacks. We don't get paid. We just know a lot of people in the field. And Tammy will be glad to make a referral to a couples therapist or, um, and I know that there's a CSAT involved, but maybe there needs to be someone to see you both. Yeah. Okay. So next question, Dr. Rob. Hi, Betrayed Partner here. Been with my essay for six years. D-Day was six months ago. I watched a lecture of Dr. Rob's online that said something to the effect of wanting your patients to recognize their inner asshole. That would be a Dr. Rob saying that Dr. Rob worries more about the essays who say they know they can be a good person that you do about the ones that recognize they are assholes. Can you talk more about that? I feel like there's fear around sending an addict into shame by making them a bad person. I, I, I suspect that. Do, do you get what it means? Because I think I do. You know, yeah. you, you talk about well, the there's people a reason that think why they've got it. Yes. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Well, in certain kinds of therapy, we talk about your inner child. And what that means is that, you know, we talk about your inner teenager, we talk about your inner adult, we talk, we kind of break people into parts. It's called IFS or, and it always escapes me what it means. Internal Thank you. family internal systems. Fa uh -huh. Right. Eternal family systems, which really you're looking at the family inside of you, the little kid who says, I want what I want. And the teenager who's all of that. So oftentimes when someone has trauma and abuse, we do ask them to go back and respect and get to know that little kid inside them who was hurt that inner child if you were if you will and i think and i understand that sex addicts do need to learn that but what i'm interested in is not so much what's happened to you but what are you capable of and so when i say that term inner asshole what i capable of, i usually don't say that in, on online but i guess i did to me that what what that means is i want you to know how much you can hurt someone how badly your behavior can can be i know you were hurt i know you were harmed and we do appreciate you're looking at that but I, at the moment if you're still acting out or if you're hurting someone and don't care about it i i will literally ask the guys in treatment because we do run a treatment center to write down all of the ways that they ha have harmed people and all the way sec in terms of their sexual behavior, lying, cheating, all that. And I also want to look at what they're, what are they capable of? Are they capable of coming of coming home from a, being a sex worker and giving you an STD? You know, um, and it isn't because I want to shame them. It's because it is just too easy to avoid the harm that it, I don't want to think of myself as having harmed people. I don't want to look at my behavior as being harmful. I don't want to look at it as escalating. Uh, and it's much easier. I was talking to a client today to look at my own pain, my own losses, my own, you know, poor baby, bad things happen to you. And I get that, but it isn't okay to say, well, bad things happen to me. And that's what I'm going to focus on if I'm actively hurting someone else. So I do think you're also confusing a couple of things, um, which is um, the clients that I worry about are the people who say, I've got this. I'm in a great place. I'm never going to act out again, especially when they leave seeking integrity and they're like, I've got it. I worry about them because we don't get it. It is a one day at a time process. So when someone leaves treatment and they say, you know, this is going to be hard and I am worried that I'm going to slip again and I don't want to hurt my relationship and I'm not sure I know how to do it right, but I just have to put one foot in front of the other. I respect that person. They understand the power of the part of them that can cause harm and they get how vulnerable they are. But the person who says, I'm good, I've got it together. I worry about that person because they're overestimating the power of their emotional problem of addiction. So Tammy, you're nodding your head. So um, I'm that's nodding my head vigorously that you, yes, well said, we'll move on. That was like, yes. Okay. okay. Hi there. I'm a betrayed partner. It has been an insidious journey, kind of like drops of water finally filling up a glass, although he will not admit he knows that I know. I feel stuck and not sure what to do. I have so many heart to heart 
I have had so many heart to hearts, but nothing comes up out of it. Any suggestions? Tammy, do you want to start this one? I mean, yes, you hear I this just from put partners all the time. I put the residential treatment program link in there, but this is this is a perfect example of when a Dr. Rob expert consultation would be, you know, would be so helpful because, and, and Dr. Rob has shared this before on webinars, but, you know, he talks about the guys come to our treatment program and I go, my, my wife or spouse or partner or whatever has said this to me a hundred times and, you know, and, and, and I couldn't hear it, you know? Um, so, so, but Dr. Rob does a one-time two hour expert consultation with couples and he's listening to both via Zoom. He does them with people all over the world via Zoom uh, so that he can listen to both of you, each of you and gather information and help identify the issues and provide guidance. And sometimes that is the first time that, you know, that an addict will hear, you know, um, uh, and acknowledge things. And then there's, you know, then there's resources that can be provided depending on the level of, you know, of support needed, but, but, but I hear for you. So, so I'm going to flip a little bit to healthy boundaries for you, you know, like you're apparently hitting your head up against a brick wall. So, um, so your healthy boundaries are for your safety, your physical safety. Dr. Rob talked about STD tests earlier, you know, financial safety, making sure you have transparency on you know, the finances. Cause you know, lots of people spend lots of money on their addiction, um, emotional, safety what do you need for your emotional safety and spiritual you know Troy Love talks about relational safety so so those aspects there's lots of stuff on that um but but I would really encourage you to to have an expert consultation with Dr. Rob you can email me at the email address on the chat Tammy T-A-M-I at Seeking Integrity and I can give you more information and dates and times to consider that but but otherwise it's to to me it would be what do I need to do to take care of myself? Because I hear the pain and the drip, drip, drip of water and finally filling up the glass. But to me, that would be the water torture of like drip, 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 drip. You know, it's not filling up the glass. It's just torture. So um, so hopefully that's helpful. Dr. Rob, thoughts? Well, just it makes me sad. Like when you say I've had just so many heart to hearts, but nothing comes of it or nothing comes out. And I think, well, this person is patronizing you. You know, they just want to say, oh, I hear what you have to say, but they don't actually want to do anything about it. And that, too, is abusive, I think, because to give you hope that something's really going to change, but then it never really does. And then you find out more. You know, I, I just again, and this is different than what Tammy said, I wonder what support you are getting for this. And you are someone who should be in some of the betrayed partner support groups. I know that we have a betrayed partners training that starts tomorrow, right? Because I heard someone was Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, Obviously. yeah, it's the online work group with Angela Spearman. She's great. So yeah. And that's like six weeks and that's an actual educational program. Yes. The link is but, in the chat, but you can always email me and I'm happy to point you to it. So I guess the last thing I want to say is where you say I feel stuck and not sure what to do. There isn't anything you can do to help the situation, but you can get unstuck. You can gain information. You can get support from other men or women who, you know, I don't know what kind of partner you are. Um, you can move. And I was just talking to a, a woman in one of my consultations today, and I could see that she was moving. She was taking a class. She was going to the right kind of therapy. She was going to support groups and she was growing and he wasn't. And as he as she grew and he remained entrenched in what he was doing in his position, at a certain point, I knew that she wasn't going to be able to tolerate living in this situation anymore. And he was used to having control. But the stronger she got, the more she learned, the less stuck she got because of her learning and connection to other women, the less likely it was that she was going to be willing to tolerate this. So you you. You may stay stuck in the relationship, but it doesn't mean you have to stay stuck. And I think if you start growing and learning and coming to situation, situations like this, the answer will be for you. I don't have to be stuck. This person and I together may be stuck, but on my own, I can move. And when you do, I think you'll get the answers to the relationship. Okay. Next question. Separated two years, seeing a CSAT, did a polygraph early on and passed, but wants more specific one with new therapist. Doesn't know if she wants to try to reconcile, so reconcile still. Waiting for more discovery, even though there really isn't, but we'll do another discovery with a new therapist. Raised kids last 20 years as a stepfather, but won't talk to me at all for the last two years. Continues to tell me how I've destroyed her life, etc. I can't seem to do anything right. Don't know what to do. So... Well, if I'm involved with someone 
and we've had serious problems and issues, but we, and we've worked on it. We did a polygraph, we went to therapy, but this person is telling me, I'm not sure I want to reconcile, reconcile. They've spent two years being separated from me and they continue to say, I destroyed your life. And no matter what you do, it can't be right at two years. You know, I begin to think, well, you need to be finding a way to move toward each other. And this, I guess, woman or partner is pushing you further away and making more demands. You know, if I had met some expectations, I'd gone to therapy, I'd done a disclosure, I'd passed a polygraph. I was still working on this actively. And my partner would remain two years later in a position of not sure I want to live with you. I'm not sure I want to be with you. I look at behavior. And if this person is an active journey of moving closer to you and you're dating each other and maybe after about a year you move back in together, that would make me hopeful. But I worry about your denial. You know, I worry about you. It's funny when we're addicts, we don't think we have we are ever deserving of anything and that we need to be punished forever. But at a certain point, what I have seen, and I have to say this partners won't like this. At a certain point, your anger and distancing becomes counterproductive if we are doing our work. That at a certain point, my real healthy needs for intimacy and connection and love are going to start showing up. And if you continue to withdraw and rage and um, and talk about not being with me, at a certain point, I'm going to move on as I should. And so I don't know if your partner is able to begin to move past where they are. But I have to tell you, when couples have been separated for two years and you're still getting blamed, I don't feel hopeful for the relationship because um, I don't hear you moving toward each other. I hear that you're still being tested as to whether you are even worthy of being involved with. And, you know, that just doesn't seem that doesn't feel right to me. Um, maybe Tammy can opine on this. Well, no, I'm I actually put in the chat Gavin Sharp did a great. Uh, webinar, and I put the link in on why everyone needs healthy boundaries, including addicts. So to me, I was like, I'm going to flip it, Be like, you know, healthy boundaries for you. I also, you know, and one more, and I didn't, I don't remember which one it was, but Dr. Eddie Capricci did a really good one. And I want to say it was in the 12 to 14 months ago on, you know, he kind of was like, you know, hey, partners, like Dr. Rob said, you know, at some point, you know, you need to get unstuck and, and what, and he shared what that looked like. So it was well done and, you know, and thoughtful, but, and, and regardless of who was saying it at two years, if you're not talking and there's no plan, um, but I, I will quickly say, I will gloss over it, but with a polygraph, you know, the American Psychological Association does not, you know, um, does not uh encourage the find use merit of the in, yeah right right so there's no there's no they measure stress not honesty there's no protocol there's no efficacy so so you passed one okay and and it didn't help with anything either so 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 to me i i would really wonder about you know what you're looking for you know it and how someone just is kind of the same same thing, just opposite side of this person is not willing to step into the gap, you know, for the relationship. One more thing, Dr. Rob and Dr. Stan Tatkin did a podcast, We Do, and it was January of 2019. I actually looked it up and found it. Um, but I love that one because it talks about in a healthy relationship, we are focusing on how we each are focusing on the relationship and, and, and how do we move from the place where we're separated and close that gap. And, and I don't hear any gap closing. So I, you know, I think it might be time to look at what do you need to do for you to move forward and stay in recovery. You know, your recovery has to be primary. Those of us in addiction have got to focus on how do we do this because if we lose that, we, you know, we're no good to ourselves or anyone else. So I'm really sorry. And I hate when, when people get stuck on it, either side of the equation. So I have a, a few more things to say, Tammy, mm -hmm, and please. I don't mean to take up a lot of time. No, with no, this. it's all good. Um, so there's a couple of things. Number one is um, um, I see suffering children here. I don't know what your partner said to them but you, these children you've raised for 20 years and now they're not talking to you what is being said to them how is the relationship you with you being undermined again it's more separation what I think your partner doesn't realize is that these kids have a relationship with you for 20 years and you matter to them and whatever's being done to distance them from you it hurts them 
Um, and even if you don't get to back together, these children have needs. They are, you're part of their lives and there should be some way, whether this person's anger you or not, to re-engage with these children. And I do want to say to you partners, you know, at a certain point, if we're really trying to do our work, you have to stop punishing us. You know, yes, you carry your hurt. Yet, no, you won't trust us forever. But there has to be some acknowledgement that that I guess the word I want to use, and this is I use this a lot, Tammy, is the word intent. You know, it's a really important word to me, because if I intended to hurt you, if it was my purpose to let you down and make you feel badly, please run. But if I am broken and and I'm an addict and I have all these issues, but I'm working on them and I didn't mean to hurt you. And I just did inadvertently or blamed you because it made me easier, easier for me to do what I wanted Then I never intended to hurt you. Um, and if that's not my intent, maybe there's a place to move forward. Once you understand that I really, really am broken and not someone who's a bad person. Finally, Tammy, I just want to say to you, you in your wonderful self sometimes say, well, Eddie said this. And, and I think to explain to the folks who knew that we have folks who do lectures for us and that some of them, like Angela Spearman and Eddie Caparucci are people who volunteer their time to do lectures on our website that you can find. I think there may also be on YouTube. I'm putting a link. Yes, and, they are all on YouTube. And because, so. and I love you, Tammy. Tammy knows these people so well, respects these people so well, and she's used to people calling and saying, you know, I saw this on your platform or on your website, but let me tell you, there's a lot of good information that is free. There's a lot of lectures. There's a lot of talks. And so when Tammy says, so-and-so said, um, or you should really listen to such and such, she's talking about things that have been done for us that live on the Seeking Integrity website that you can hear and learn from. Um, and so Eddie and Caparucci people do said, email me all the time and say, you said something. And I just, so, so it's okay. I'm going to, if I say you. something, email me. So <laughs> it's just, a, she, and honestly, Tammy gets excited every single day about the possibility we both do that, that we can move people forward and the yes. people who come to help us, we promote them and support them because they're giving you information that can also help you heal. So, um, but I'm aware that some people have no idea who we are, or where this comes from. So I just want to give you a little plug as to how to find these things. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's move. So ahead. the next one is I have betrayed my wife and hurt her tremendously. I do not know how to connect emotionally with her now. Any suggestions? So I'm going to actually, I'm going to type the answer out of the doghouse work group starts this week, this week. So you can talk about that, but I'm going to type the link. Well, out of the doghouse is a book that I wrote a number of years ago. Um, and the subtitle is um, out of a the relationship doghouse, saving a guide relationship for men have been healing caught guide cheating. for men caught cheating. Um, and there's also one, uh, there's a Christian version for those men who are, who are faith-based. Um, and both of those books are directed toward how, what is empathy? What is compassion? You know, I feel bad for what I did and I hate myself is not the saying, same thing as saying, I really hurt you and I really let you down and I completely understand why you don't trust me. And I think men in particular have a hard time understanding what it means to have wounded somebody through betrayal. And honestly, a lot of us think flowers and candy. And if I take you on vacation and I really prove I'm sorry, and it's really not about that. It's about making you feel like I understand what you're going through. And that I'm not defending myself or protecting myself because I'm the one who did all of this. The other thing though, Tammy, is it doesn't say what I don't see here is a timeline. And so does this mean mm. that six weeks ago you betrayed this person right. or a year ago? Fair. It also means some people think, well, as time goes by, they're going to be less hurt and less angry. It's not about time. It's about action. What are you doing to, and it may not be, maybe you're not a sex addict, but what are you doing in your, did you go to your own therapy? Are you going to some groups? What are you willing to do? This just happened also today in one of my consults where we went through all the pain that the spouse was going through. And the husband basically said, well, I'm going to therapy. What do you want from me? And I think what she wanted was, and by the way, when did he go to therapy? When she said, are you going to therapy? And a lot of times when I do my consultations with a man and a woman and the woman who's been harmed, I'll say, 
Who found my podcasts? She did. Who found the YouTubes? She did. Who found our website? She did. Who got in touch with Tammy and arranged the, con arranged the consultation? She did. And of course, what partners are looking for is for you to take responsibility for your behavior. And I said to him, you know, if you want this to get better, don't sit around and do things when she's nagging you go because you've turned her into that person she is nagging you because she wants the relationship to work and she wants to see you doing these things but what will make her feel contented and hopeful will be when you say let me tell you the things i'm doing today um, and you don't have to worry about a thing because you know that i'm working on these things and you can see it so the last piece I will say is, and this sums it all up, is connecting emotion with her now is not about anything you say, because she shouldn't believe anything you say. You've betrayed her tremendously. What matters is what are you doing? Doing, doing, doing. What actions are you taking to show that you are committed to change? Um, and that will comfort her far more than anything that you say. But if you're going to say something, <laughs> I recommend you go out of the doghouse. By the way, what Tammy's talking about is that we develop work groups around some of my books like Sex Addiction 101. And there is a work group for men, I think it's men only, who have betrayed a female partner. And it is the out of the doghouse workbook or work group where we've actually written a workbook for the for the book and we take we take these folks through homework and steps and stages. And, you know, I do think while well, Tammy's typing that as addicts, we need direction. You know, we don't need poor baby. I'm sorry you hurt yourself and someone else. We need, what do I need to do? What is my first step? What is my second step? What actions do I need to take to heal? Um, and that's the whole purpose of the work groups is for you to be able to see maybe something you can't see in therapy, which is the intellectual piece. What does this mean? Why did I do it? How do I fix it? What's the next thing? That's what the work groups are for. Um, Tammy, let's, uh, anything else you so, want to keep? It, no, no, the next one. And it's similar. So um, with the, I'm recommending okay. out of the doghouse for this one too, but my husband is SA and I'm trying to be patient, but I snap when I get triggered and speak out of, of my character. It's not good. And I feel bad after I spot off to him. I'm upset because I talked to him while he was watching a football today. And he says he's upset because he didn't get to watch the football game because I was upset and expressing my feelings on how he's hurt me. And, and I just don't understand his thinking. He's done his first sex addiction 101. That's an online work group. And he seemed like he was thinking more, but now he's in between classes and it's almost like he's going back to his defensive ways. When I express my feelings, I found out about the betrayal seven months ago. So they're very still early in the process. Um, I think talking about the Thanos a little bit, Tammy, would be useful yes. here. Well, if Thanos, but here's the deal. It's like, if all he, I say this all the time, I love our work groups. If that's all he's done, that is so not enough. You know, the an addiction is a maladaptive coping mechanism. It's a 24-7 chronic condition. And doing one work group for six weeks for 90 minutes a week, that's a total of nine hours to combat years and decades, you know, of problematic behavior is not enough, you know. So if you told me he was going to his 12-step every day and he's been working with his sponsor and he's doing his steps, Purpose. I would be a lot more hopeful. But but of course he's going to go back. Like, like I'm in recovery, Dr. Rob, too, for a longer period of time and guess what you know we can slide backwards if we choose to or we can move forward with our recovery i choose to continue to move forward that's uh, my life is so much better but i still go to meetings i still talk to people i still do what i need to do to take care of myself he has done almost nothing you know so if he you know yes yeah, sex addiction 101 part two out of the doghouse our drop-in groups, if you told me he's going to all the men's drop-in groups every week, that would be helpful. Podcasts are helpful. I get that, but they're also learning. at you. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. learning, but it's not, there's no accountability. There's, you know, I can go, oh yeah, yeah, that's good. But I can be dismissive of it. But like an out of the doghouse work group, guess what? People go, oh, I've read the book. Guess what? Somebody else saying something and you go, oh, me too. Having the facilitator talk about something, you hear it in a different way than skimming over a paragraph that you didn't really like and don't want to really look at. So, so it matters. But just like Dr. Rob said a minute ago, it's about action, you know, so, but I, so again, I'm going to flip it you know, what are you doing to take care of yourself? I hope you are signed up for the Betrayed Partner work group that starts on Wednesday. Huge, you know, helpful for you. Our drop-in groups, I'm glad you're here. Again, you know, you being able to um, talk, um, um, uh, you know, uh, 
I, I will say, and this is just a husband and wife thing is like, I have learned not to talk to my husband during certain sporting events. It will never go well. And, and he's not an addict. Like, I'm just telling you, like I, I pick my timing, you know, if I really want to be heard, that would not be a good time. So I'm not giving him, I'm not giving him an off the hook. I'm just saying I can, pick, pick, I could tell you how it's going to go before I even like, like, I will not be seen or heard. So, well, and I want to say, and the reason I mentioned the Thanos and I still want you to talk about it is, mm -hmm. you know, if this I'm person, I want to take the other side, maybe he's going to lots of meetings. Maybe he's in therapy. Maybe the course was a part of a larger picture. Maybe he is really working hard. I don't know. You didn't say it, but then I do think that there are times when, that you can set you know, I, I, when you're going to talk about things. And I understand spouses, believe me, that you are the greatest detectives. You do PhDs in sex addiction. You're trying to help understand what's happened to you. But it isn't helpful to go after us all day long and say, I know you're talking to the kids, but get out here and, you know, well, you just have to stop. In other words, when you're angry or upset and you want an answer, as Tammy said, that may not be the most productive time that you're going to get one. But what we talk about is setting a time every evening, for example, if you're both free, where you just take a half hour and say every night, you know, we're not going to go through this all day long. We're not going to bring it up every time it crosses my mind. Um, if I see your legs crossed, I'm not going to say, oh, you're angry at me and I about what I did. A spouse is not going to say, oh, I saw you pick up the milk and there was a woman on there. You must. Why are you? We bring those things up at a certain time when we are both committed to being able to talk about it. Um, because I might dismiss you during the game. I don't mean to dismiss you, but I want to watch that game. The last thing I want to say is about sex, these work groups. They are not the answer. They are part of the answer. They are the intellectual. So the reason we do them is because an hour of therapy and going to a support group is not going to give you the intellectual information about what is this about? How do I work through it? What steps do I need to take? And we all need information in our heads, not just our hearts. But I have seen people say, oh, well, I took the Sex Addiction 101 course. What do you want from me? And they do it to check a box and they do it to shut you up. And they do to say, well, I did this. Why don't you leave me alone? And I wouldn't leave it alone because there's, as Tammy said, this is a lifelong emotional problem that this prob person probably had before they ever met you. And if they think that they're going to take a course and then you should just leave them alone, then one of you doesn't understand the depth of the problem. And I agree with you. I wouldn't feel safe at all if they were being defensive, but they could read out of the doghouse. That is a good way to learn to be non-defensive. I, I know I want to say to you guys, we're not in the sales business here. We volunteer our time. We do mention things that we are doing that cost money, but I would believe that they're really incredibly helpful and useful. I just want to mention that we do have partners retreats and there is one coming up where there will be, I guess, about eight or 10 partners and there will be maybe five or six therapists and they're going on a retreat. They're actually going away to spend uh, a long weekend together. And it's all girl time. There's no men around. We do them, I guess, every three or four months. And um, this is a time to, I don't mean to say it in this way, let your hair down and be with other people where you can really get it out and really gain insight. And if you are struggling and you have the resources, Tammy's going to be there. Um, do you want to tell, did you put a, a little, I put a link in there's, there's two of them. There's one, one, uh, in January and there's another one in March and there's information. Um, I, I just put the link up. We're running out of time and we've got a bunch of questions. So I want to say I'm one putting more thing all about of these the... resources in there and I want you to email me or call with any questions, but please. And really quickly about the partners retreat. Um, you have so many questions. You have so much emotional overwhelm, you know, and I think there are pieces where you just need to be held in an emotional way and be able to move past where you are. And it's really important to see other women who are in the same situation, that you're not alone, that no matter how smart, pretty, attractive, loving, no matter how long you've been together, that this happens to other women, too, because addicts say it's your fault and you did this and you're not that. And it isn't about that at all. Um, so let's. And this let's is empowered moving. women. We we are looking to give you resources and help the lifeline to move forward. Not you know be stuck, you know in the, the you know like yeah this stuff happened. Um, but but you know, like like it does not have to define you forever. You know in that victimization. We we want to give you support and help to you know to help you move forward. So okay. And Tammy I will have, be there. 
I know, but yeah, like, it's not about me. Like, seriously, I will be in the background. It really is about the facilitators and they're listed. They are amazing women. You know, Debbie McRae, Angela Spearman, our clinical director, our family specialist, I mean, all of those people. Um, and, and yeah, I forgot somebody else. Oh, Dr. Susan LeBrock, who did a couple. So yes, all, you know, all of those therapists, you know, and I'm just going to be the, sh- I'm going to be the chauffeur. I'm going to be driving the van. So, okay. My husband doesn't agree with it. sex ab- addict labels. He has cheated on every partner before me and the entirety of our 22 year marriage. He says he just has a lack of impulse control. According to him, he was told by a therapist, not a CSAT. Um, I don't know, but um, I put in the, in the um, chat, on our sec, uh, Seeking Integrity website, we have a quick self-assessment. It is not what we use for clients coming into our residential treatment program, but that's a good gauge, you know, of, you know, the level, you know, and somebody scoring a six is different than somebody scoring a 16, but I, please address, oh, it's not that label. It's just lack of impulse control, but I've cheated on everybody. So, you know. I don't care what you call it. I think it matters that I, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if I'm gonna cheat on you, for the entirety of your marriage, and I have cheated on everyone that I've ever met, then there's something wrong with me. That I can allow myself to hurt people, let them down, manipulate them, use them, hide things from them. Again, to me, it's not uh, so much about the cheating, it is for you, but it's about the way this person is treating their relationships and treating their lives. Um, I don't care what you call it. Um, I think that's a way to say, oh, I don't have that problem. And by the way, a lot of therapists do not understand this. You know, so they will say, oh, no one could be addicted to sex. Well, this is why we are here to be able to explain, to be able to support, to be the professor. This is why we put up all these free resources for you to really understand. You just cut out. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. There's no sound coming out. You mess with your, your buds. Your buds. Okay. Now I can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. That's why we put up. No, I can't hear you again. So um, now I can. Okay, let me, let me no, I can hear you. Don't um, leave them. Okay. Okay, I I am not interested in what this person calls it. What I am interested in is: Are they finding a way to respect you to? gain insight into why they act this way. And you, by the way, didn't go to that therapy, I'm guessing. So you don't know what this therapist really told him. You just know, like you said, the therapist, the lack of impulse control, according to him. Well, I don't, I think most of the partners are aware that we lie. And if we can get out of something and uh, tell you that someone said we don't have a problem, we will, because we want to keep doing what we're doing. And by the way, I think he's still cheating on you. I'm so sorry to say that, but um he, what he's doing and wants to be able to do is more important than the relationship with you um, at this moment. Okay, let's keep- We have a residential treatment keep... program. We have resources for you. So again, healthy boundaries for you. And please get an STD test, you know, as well. Okay, married 27 years, D-Day three months ago, prostitutes um, and all recently and, and other acting out with women 10 years and 20 years ago. How do I not feel like my entire marriage is a lie? And I'm just an object. Well, I, I don't know your marriage. Um, but if you've been married that long, um, and I think that a lot of long term partners do realize that the immediate hurt that you're feeling doesn't mean that there haven't been meaningful things in your marriage. Maybe you did have children, maybe you did um, deeply involve yourself with your family together. Maybe you traveled or bought homes or built support for each. You know, I, I don't think that couples, um, couples have been together that long, tend to share a whole lot more than just this. But this becomes such a huge overwhelming issue that none of that matters. You know, and it is true that if you love me and have taken care of me and kind to me and I've been everything with you and we've had and all, had all kinds of wonderful things happen, but I smack you across the face every night. Well, and then you're not going to really see all those wonderful things, nor should you. You're going to see the pain that I put you in. I don't think your marriage has been a lie, but I do think that there are certain parts of it that have been hidden from you and that that are that you thought were one thing and haven't turned out to be what I think this part. I do think you're married to someone who lies and who is protecting their behavior. But I'll tell you, every partner says, how could you love me and do this to me? I thought you cared about me and yet you're doing this. Does that mean that everything's been a lie? And I only you two can believe that. But I think feelings are not facts. 
And because you feel that everything has been a lie, that doesn't mean that it has been. Um, have you been an object? Well, in some ways, because if I felt who you were and were really in touch with a person, I couldn't do these things to you. So have you been used? Have you been taken advantage of? Absolutely. Are you solely an object to this person? I don't know. I'll say this to you. If you move three inches away from him or changing your life and maybe not being with him, he will come racing after you. The most independent blaming, it's your fault. I'm going to do what I want, addict. The minute we start to move away from them, all of a sudden they realize how important we are and they will come chasing after us or their own recovery most of the time. So anything else, Tammy, about this? Oh, by the way, your feelings are what they are. Feelings are fine. That, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you that's a, a, of course. And there's grief, you know, so, so, but like Dr. Rob said, you, you know, yes, there, like, it isn't all, you know, all like it, it isn't all just a, you know, an illusion or whatever. I'd like, yes, there was real things. And then there's this other, you know, so they're, you know, they're going on simultaneously. So, so it's difficult for partners to understand because you would never do this. You would never act this way. And, and that's what's so t challenging is for you to understand in his brokenness, he did these things and they're reprehensible and horrible and hurtful. And, and does he love you? Yes. And, you know, so that those do not work in your world, but in the compartmentalized world of an addict, yet they do on, you know, on, and it's unfortunate, well, but that's what we heal in recovery. And I appreciate Tammy saying that, but saying that because as an addict, I literally say you're over here and my life is with you is over here and it is what it is. And then over here, there's this other situation that I don't talk about. And I try to keep them as separate as I can so that I can do both. Um, but there still is meaning in the relationship. It's just that I compartmentalize these two parts. Yes. So I don't have to look at, if I, uh, how do I say this? You'd have to be really, really crazy cuckoo nuts to deeply love someone and be connected to them and care about them and hurt them at the same time. It's not that we don't care about you. It's that in order to be able to do what we do, we blame you. We say we don't get what we need from you. And then we feel entitled to go over there and do what we want to do. It makes us it makes it easier for me to yes. not have feelings about you and go over there. But it doesn't mean I don't have feelings about you. Um, yeah, we should it move goes on back to the, the first. I know we should. But the, it's like the first question where it's like he blames me and says, if I don't give him sex, then I he's justified in going out. And, and that's absolutely addict brain. So. Okay, next question. What are your thoughts on no masturbation? My essay partner has been unable to maintain sobriety. We've been working on this for nearly two years. I di didn't have a hard line on it, but he does in, in very sneaky ways, lies about it, and has had one week of sobriety from porn at best. We can't afford professional therapy. Well, I do think this is where you really belong in the betrayed partners groups, and you might go to some um, uh, um, S anon or other support groups or partners, there's an awful lot you don't have to pay for, pardon me, that you can learn from and learn about. You know, I don't know what, what he really went into treat, what he really got sober from. Can some of us masturbate? Yes. Cause it doesn't kick up the addiction. Can we masturbate with porn? Never. I don't think we can ever in, enter those kinds of objectified situations. But I'm more concerned about the lying and the secrecy because why not just talk about it? Why not just be open about it unless there's more going on than you know, or I feel so much shame about it. But he should know if it's sobriety or not. And every addict in recovery, every addict who's a sex addict is working on themselves has a plan. And that plan very clearly says these things are acting out and these things are not. And they don't just change from day to day. They are long-term commitments. And if I want to change them, I meet with someone like a sponsor, a therapist. And I also turn to my partner and say, I am thinking of changing this. And I wonder how you feel. In other words, I'm completely open. I'm completely transparent. When someone starts sneaking around and hiding things and they're being disrespectful, they're manipulating you, they're right back in the addiction. It doesn't matter whether they're acting out or not. What matters is... I, the clue to me, the clue to me that someone is acting out is how they're treating the relationship. Um, are they distancing themselves? Are they emotionally unavailable? Are they angry all the time? Are they hiding things? Um, are they trying to make me feel better even though I don't feel safe? That to me is a much more of a clue as to whether the masturbation is okay or not than the fact that he or she is doing it. Um, so the hiding, the sneakiness, the lies, 
this is not someone who's in recovery, regardless of whether sobriety includes masturbation or not. Um, we should do one more because. Okay, we, we will. Because I, I typed in one answer to the last one. So D Day was October of 23 and uh, with discoveries of multiple infidelities and porn addiction. My SA husband got a CSAT and went to SI in May of last year. Been uh, since attending SI, he has been attending SA and SAA meetings and meeting with a sponsor. As if the trauma from the betrayal was not enough, as part of the discovery, I was horrible and horrendous and unthinkable comments he said to the affair partners about me, the betrayed spouse. I am on many webinars that supported the betrayed spouse, but I have not heard anyone ask how to navigate through damaging, disrespectful full dialogue he had with the fair partners even though he's in good recovery and his actions are indicating the same how can i ever get past this it is as harmful it is as harmful as the betrayals and porn addiction mm. so but i'm going to make an assumption that this person the partner the addict is doing well that they are working on yes. it that they're not acting out yes. but that you are can't stop but being reminded of that the addict said things like oh well my marriage is really tough but i really love you or your body is so sexy or whatever it is that this person said online well, my that you can now really... read yes right yes. and we say things like that well you know i know i shouldn't be talking about sex but my marriage is so unhappy and you know you're really the one i could see loving and you know it's once you read that stuff you can't unsee it um and it but the question is, can you stop ruminating about it and make some peace with it when you've made peace with so many other things? Um, and, you know, by the way, this is part of the betrayal. You say trauma of betrayal was this as if this is something separate. This is part of your betrayal is seeing how this person was able to be with you and love you, but talk you down and use you in order to act out. Um, so, Tammy, what are your thoughts? You hear this a lot. How do they no negotiate through? What, you know, what, here's what I hear is he's getting help and you're in the drop-in groups and, and, and webinars. Great. But I don't hear that you're working with an individual therapist for your betrayal trauma, that you're doing some trauma work, um, perhaps some EMDR because those ruminating thoughts or somatic experience. There are some uh, trauma modalities that may help you with those specific issues and they won't take away the trauma, but it can help lessen it so that it isn't oh, that, you know, gut reaction and that horrible pain. Um, uh, and that, you know, um, like with EMDR and you can even replace as a thought comes in and you're starting to get triggered, you know, you, it, you learn to replace it with a useful thought that, you know, is more helpful. So, so what I don't hear with this and, and you may be doing it, but what I don't hear is that you're working with a qualified betrayal trauma specialist for you uh, to provide support and work through that trauma that you are, you know, that you are experienced, but yeah, yeah it's, it's real. It's painful. And I want to know something that neither you or I mentioned, which is, this all started in October last year. Yeah, it's been three yeah. months. Yes. The expectations of yourself are way too high. It yeah. takes, and many of the partners will tell you, a year or more to get over the intense reactivity. And every time you see him sitting at the computer wondering what he's saying and what he's doing. And, you know, this this is not going to go away in three months. And so right. what I hear is someone who wants to, it wants it to get better, wants to hurt less, wants to stop thinking about this. And I think any partner who's been working on this will tell you that those are unreasonable expectations of your of yourself um, and that you need to be more gentle and say, you know, I might be really ruminating about this and hurting for a long time. Um, before but you don't have to, with it. But, but get help because you it doesn't have to be that intense and you, and you can get like like EMDR, like on one specific issue can pretty quickly on one specific issue, it won't take away all the trauma, but, but please, you know, get the professional help, you know, for those things, because, because it doesn't have to feel this intense and horrible, you know, for 18 months or whatever. So that's what I'm saying is like, yes, and there's support. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> Happy New Year again. It's good. To, I'm sorry everyone. you folks have to be here, but I'm glad that we yeah. can be here for you. Yes. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye for now.